Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's wonderful to have you all here today. We are thrilled to bring this special event to you on such an urgent topic. Um, I want to introduce myself quickly. I'm Jill Felicio. I am the Director of Advancement here at Harvard's DCE. I'm also a member of the class of 2000 and the class of 2013 for Harvard Extension. Uh, pleasure to welcome you all here today and good afternoon if you're here uh, on the East Coast, but we have people from five continents, so good evening to many of you, and we are just thrilled to see faces old and new. Um, I wanted to just mention real quick uh, that this is part of a series of events that we are holding throughout the year, so check back into our website for other faculty-led events such as this on topics that are so relevant today as well as social hours, uh, ways to bring our community together around the world, uh, professional development opportunities and career advancement opportunities. Um, as you know, we've, we've visited so many of you in cities around the world for the past several years, but due to COVID and how the world is struggling, we are completely virtual these days. Uh, so you can find an array of offerings that bring us together from far and wide, uh, such as this, now it's really my pleasure to introduce Teo. Teo Nikolai is a real estate developer who is passionate about teaching. He is the president of his own real estate investment company, Nikolai LLC. And he has twice served as the vice president of the Apartment Association of Metro Denver. He is a board member of the Colorado Apartment Association and was named the Association of Metro Denver's Person of the Year. Prior to starting this investment company, Teo was the director of, of finance and acquisitions for a $500 million real estate investment company in Illinois. Now he holds a bachelor's degree from Harvard College and has recently taught his 81st course at Harvard DCE, including his very own real estate courses. And to date, nearly 4,000 students have taken his courses. Now Harvard Extension School has awarded Teo with the Joanna Fusa Distinguished Teaching Award He's also a two-time winner of the Harvard Extension Student Association's Student Choice Award. Now his courses are among the most popular in Harvard Extension School history and artfully done and so well orchestrated. Now, uh, many of you I suspect have taken these courses, the principles of real estate, as well as real estate finance and investment. So without further ado, it is truly a pleasure to introduce Teo. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you to all of you who are here. Um, I understand that we have uh, over a thousand people who have registered for this, um, and and that I think speaks to how important this topic is. Um, and you you got a little bit of my introduction, um, but uh, but I hope everyone um, shares in the urgency of this time. Uh, because we have an opportunity to make a significant contribution to our communities. Um, and especially in the case of, of affordable housing, um, there are significant social implications of this. Um, and just to tackle it head on, um, affordable housing is something that is a key, it's a center point of the challenges that particularly in the United States, but certainly around the world, that we're addressing with regard to our failure to address systemic racism. Um, and if the events of the past six months or much less the, 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 the our history of our country, um, if, that, if that makes your, your, your blood scream and, and your heart break, um, if your soul is on fire to try to help, affordable housing is a place for you to contribute and to lend a hand. And so we have a thousand people who are part of this right now. Uh, I hope we have a hundred thousand that will continue to help because there's a lot of, of uh, progress to be made and a lot of things that we can do. So let's jump right in. Um, I'm going to start. I, we, we only have, I'm going to try to keep it to about 45, 50 minutes so we have time for questions. So we have a lot of ground to cover. Um, so I kind of want to start with a, with a prologue, uh, basically uh, noting some, playing out some facts I think we're all going to agree to up front, uh, and that way we can cover some, some other ground. Um, so first and foremost is there is an affordable housing crisis in the United States, uh, and indeed around the world. Um, so I think we can all agree on that. I'll show you a couple of slides, but, uh, but I hope I won't need to convince you of that. Um, I also want to note that the adverse impacts, um, those are real, um, and they directly and indirectly affect all of us. And those effects are significant, and, and therefore it's worth our while to think about 
um, thoughtful public policy responses in order to improve our cities, uh, the, the, the places that we live. Um, I am going to uh, throw out some things which we're going to are going to raise some eyebrows as we chat today and that's okay that's how it goes with affordable housing. Uh, one of the things I want to point out I, I start I am I am a, a landlord. Um, and so that's uh, I think it's kind of interesting I come from two worlds, the world of academia and the world of, of being a property owner and a, and a housing provider. Um, so I do want to start with this to say uh, housing providers are not the enemy uh, housing providers are eager participants and partners in creating affordable housing. Uh, much as healthcare providers uh, try, to, try to guide healthcare policy, much as teachers try to guide education policy, uh, housing providers are eager to be a part of this solution. Speaking of the solution, I just wanna start up front. If it was easy, this would have been solved long ago. Uh, this is a complicated uh, situation and one which uh, requires a lot of thought and effort. And so uh, informed public engagement is, is without question is what we need to be doing. We need more of these dialogues, um, not less. So the goal for today is to equip you with key information and a framework analysis of analysis for thinking about um, how you can advocate for change in your community. Um, so uh, in terms of, of big picture stuff, uh, again, uh, there's the, the, the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard University puts out an annual report, they actually put out a ton of information. Um, I've just grabbed three key pieces of information that they provide us with. And, um, and from their standpoint, uh, they're, 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 they're the best in the world in terms of data. Um, so what do they tell us? Uh, well, they tell us again, what we already know is there's a serious problem with affordability uh, and it's a problem that is getting worse. Um, so we know what we're looking at here is the number of renter households who are cost burdened. Um, there's a specific definition for that, but suffice to say, it's very hard for them to pay their rent. Uh, we're talking about now over 50% are, are struggling. Um, and there are significant social consequences of that. Um, it's worth noting that the, you know, when we, when we think about the, the number of, of people that are affected, uh, we'll go through some slides on that, but it's an enormous section of our population in the United States and indeed around the world. Um, I do want to note that it is something that's around the United States. Um, so everywhere we go, we run into this challenge. It is particularly uh, uh, a matter of interest in cities uh, where we have the most, the greatest challenges in shaping our urban environment. And in terms of, again, those numbers, I just want to throw it out there. Um, so what we're looking at here is we're looking at the, the cost burden rates. Um, so we, we classify uh, just this is the lingo so that when you're walking around talking to people, you, you know the lingo. Uh, we talk about cost burden in terms of how much of your income you're paying for your housing costs. And there is, there's, a, there's a bit of a range, uh, but what I've done here is I'm just, I pulled from the data. Uh, again, the, the Harvard, the, the Joint Center for Housing Studies has just wonderful data on this. Um, and, and these are, uh, what you're gonna see here is this is the low, this is the high, and of course, this is the average for the United States. So what we're seeing here is that around 23% of owner-occupied uh, households, um, that's about 17 million households are having trouble uh, meeting their housing obligations or are paying uh, what, what, what we've determined statistically is, is a kind of an unsustainable amount on their housing costs. Uh, but of course, what we're really worried about, um, especially if we're talking about affordability, especially if we're talking about social uh, inequality, um, is renters, because that is that is renting is by far and away the most common uh, place where we see low income ha um, uh, houses um, seek their housing. And, and not surprisingly, we see, again, um, slightly different cities. But the idea here is this is kind of the low end. This is the high end. This is the middle. Um, this is the United States across the country. We're just about 50%, 20.5 million households fall into this, into this category. Um, and, and that is a lot. Um, that's why I say it's important for us. It is so important that we get this right. And one of the challenges is it is very, very easy for us to get this wrong. And that is one of, that's what we want to, uh, to, to address head on. So um, the, 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 the first thing to look at is, is just, you know, if, if it's about pricing, let's just put a cap on rents, right? And then problem solved, seminar over, we can all go home and it's all set. Um, what we know, of course, is that that is not, that doesn't work. Uh, rent control is what that's known as. We're gonna talk about rent control. But the question is, um, and, and I'm gonna, I am gonna address that, but I do wanna say, um, I have worked with a lot of people who are proponents of rent control. One thing I can say universally is, we all want the same thing. We want affordability. It's just a question of how do we get there. 
And the reason that we have to think through this policy is because we have to come to grips with who actually sets the rents. All right, this is actually this is an interesting question for us. It's one we delve into in uh, in our courses, um, and that is, uh, you know, how how are rents actually set? So I, I just want to try to try to convince you that it's a little more complicated than it may sound. So imagine you have a situation. Imagine you have a, a clumsy leasing broker. They don't really know the market. Uh, the let's say the actual market uh, intro, the actual market uh, rate is is two thousand dollars per unit per month, and let's say they accidentally advertise the apartment for $20,000 a month, right? A ridiculously high number. Um, do they have the power to impose that rent? Well, they have the power to ask for it, but we know it's just going to be tumbleweeds if that happens. They're not actually going to get that rent. No one's going to rent that unit. Um, and so, uh, so they won't do business. But let's talk about the other thing. Let's talk about what happens if the rent is set uh, too low. That is to say, it's set below the market rate. Let's say they accidentally list the unit for $200 per month. What's going to happen? Well, their, their, their phone is going to absolutely explode with people who are coming to rent that unit. Um, and even if they're able to rent to one person, that's still going to leave out this whole group who are looking for housing and aren't able to find it. And so uh, again, there's a whole lot of math that goes through this, but, the, but the, suffice to say, it's important to realize that landlords don't actually control rents. And that's really important because uh, it is so tempting to think there's a lever out there, a magic switch we could, we, could, we could flick and suddenly the problem is away. But unfortunately, it's again, rent is really complicated. Uh, what else is complicated? Well, uh, look, at, look at pricing. Uh, so San Francisco is kind of the poster child for ridiculously uh, expensive housing. Uh, here we have, this was a story uh, from a couple of years ago where there was a $2 million shack. It was a teardown. Um, and, and it sold, it was, uh, it was a, uh, on a 2,400 square foot lot uh, where many people have homes that are larger than that. Uh, it sold for $2 million. Um, so the question of course is with these prices, who would want to live in San Francisco, right? Are they just crazy in San Francisco? Um, you know, if, if it was about uh, price, I have a much better solution for you. All these people who are paying $2 million to buy a, a, a teardown in San Francisco, um, what if I told you that there was a place that you could buy, and this is a real place, you could buy a home for uh, $84,000 at the start of this year. Uh, it's actually less than $80,000. Uh, such a place exists. It's, it's Akron, Ohio, right? If you want to live in, if, you, if price is all you care about, Akron is where you want to be. Now, uh, what we do know, though, is that's not what's happening here. People aren't choosing to move. They aren't saying, oh, well, I want to do San Francisco. Price is all I care about. I'm going to move to Akron. Um, and, and so apparently a lot of people, to answer the question, who wants to live in San Francisco? Apparently a lot of people. And in terms of Akron, shouldn't everyone be flocking there? Well, apparently not. And the issue, of course, is what we're buying. When it comes to rent, when it comes to housing, what are we really paying for? And here at Harvard University, we have one of the, the preeminent minds of, of, uh, in housing, and that, of course, is Edward Glazer. Um, he's the one, he focuses like a laser on housing um, and uh, in cities. Um, and he succinctly stated, he, he noted that, that we need to, to view this in terms of the choices that individuals make. Uh, so individuals choose either to live in a place or not. And they make that choice based on their uh, certainly income, but also amenities and the housing supply. The idea is it's a package deal. So it's complicated. And that's what gets us to this point of, of how do we think about the, the value people are getting. He does all sorts of great reports. Uh, again, I won't spend too much time on this. He, he compares uh, change in population to uh, median uh, mean January temperature. How, how warm is it in January? And it turns out he found there's a 60% correlation uh, between population growth and, and warm places in January, right? People respond to amenities. Um, that's kind of a, a kind of a silly one, but he he did an index to look at amenities in general. He did a very rigorous and robust analysis of amenities, and sure enough, what we find is that people move to this is change in population. People are moving to areas that have greater amenities. Um, so again, that's consistent with us. Um, this, by the way, this paper I'm referring to, this is 2009. Um, I followed up on this using the the data from the uh, Joint Center for Housing Studies. Uh, what do we find? Uh, this is uh, what we're looking at here is this is median home price to income. So it's kind of, it's an index of home prices in a, in a way, um, looking at 
income in that area. Uh, what do we see in those highest areas in Honolulu, Santa, uh, Santa, Santa Cruz, and Santa Barbara? Uh, we see very, very high home price to median income. People are spending a lot of their income on housing there. Uh, what do we see at the low end uh, in Bloomington, in, in, uh, in uh, this is Minneapolis, and this is Trenton, uh, low home price to income. Again, this is indexed to the income in that area. So we see a clear preference for people spending money to be in places where there's priority uh, and there's and there's a there's a they place a priority on their um, on their those amenities. The thing that makes housing so complicated is that it is a game of musical chairs and this is that there's there's a couple of things I want you to remember from this from this session and I want you to think of housing as a game of musical chairs right for those who don't know uh, the game is that there's a there's a fixed number of chairs and there's a group of people who are uh, competing for those chairs and at the end of the game someone is going to be left out if there are not enough chairs to go around and so we see this bidding process unfold in housing markets what we see here is is that uh there's there's you know four people bidding for four chairs or three chairs uh the in in society we don't we don't elbow our way in we 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 bid with our with our uh, resources and our money and so of course um if this person wants to get one of these chairs uh in a market what do they do they offer money, they bid up the price. And of course, if they're bidding up the price, so then are the other players in the marketplace. So they'll bid more, they'll say, no, I really, really, really want that chair. That's gonna force the other market participants to bid up as well. And unfortunately, what happens is we haven't solved the problem. We haven't found a chair for this fourth person to sit on, but we have what we have done a good job of is make this all very, very expensive. And so we, 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 this is kind of a classic uh, game theory of, of loss. The only way to win a game of musical chairs for everyone is to add more chairs, right? We need more spaces for people to sit. And if that happens, of course, now we, that person who didn't have a place to sit now has a chair and everyone else, of course, uh, that, that pressure that's on prices uh, reduces. And so um, that is kind of the, that's the idea here. It sounds, I mean, housing gets very complicated, but it, it's a very simple concept in terms of thinking about it as musical chairs. The problem we have, of course, is that there is kind of no end to the number of people, right? There are uh, right now, uh, there's about 40 million people in the United States, they're currently in the United States between 15 and 19 years old, right? Every year, about 5 million of them are going to be turning, they're gonna be turning uh, 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 18, and, and we're gonna be looking for housing for them, and they're gonna be looking for housing in these markets. So how do we ensure that they have a place to land? And that is where we run into rent control. Uh, and, and we could do, we could do a whole seminar or class on rent control. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it very short treatment here, but if there's time later, I'll be glad to, to answer any questions. Uh, but for those of you who don't know rent control, basically um, how it typically works is there's, there's a cap on rents, right? And it's, it's on existing leases. Uh, the, the, the percentages change. Uh, there's sometimes it's typically somewhere in the five to 7% range. Um, the idea is, is that there's a base rent established at the lease commencement. And each and every time that that lease expires, the landlord has to renew. Uh, they, they can't not renew, otherwise the system doesn't work. Uh, so they have to renew and they can only, uh, the maximum they can increase the rent is some uh, index, uh, you know, three to five or 7%. Uh, California adds inflation. There's also some variance, uh, uh, vacancy decontrol, which is where they actually look at what you rented to the, pr to the prior resident. Um, so that's kind of an interesting twist. New York is, is very much uh, on board with that idea. Um, and then there are exemptions for certain small properties. But what we're doing is we're putting a cap on the increase in rent. The problem is, and I get why this is sounds attractive. Uh, I mean, that's it's again, we got an easy, we got a very, very easy tool we can lay our hands on. Doesn't cost the government anything. We just say we're going to cap rent increases. We're going to make it more affordable, and it's immediate. So it's a very, very attractive, appealing idea. Uh, the problem is, of course, is it doesn't work. Um, and that, and I, I say that I know I'm not being facetious. It's just it's it's heartbreaking because if it was simple, that's what we'd want, right? We'd want that affordability. 
Um, so uh, Paul Krugman has written extensively on this. Um, he has listed, and again, we can revisit this later on if you guys have questions, uh, but he's basically revisited that it, it creates a lot of problems. Uh, and he is right, by the way, I checked before we started here, uh, in the most uh, recent edition of, of Mancuse, um, Harvard professor uh, Mancuse's uh, textbook, uh, Principles of, of um, uh, the Economics, uh, rent control is, is the poster child for a policy which creates an unusual and, and for some people unexpected, for economists entirely expected, negative consequences. And it leads to all of these challenges. Uh, but this was, uh, he, he, he wrote this, he talked about this in, in I believe it was 1999, uh, that he really came out against this, um, the, uh, or certainly in the 90s. What's really interesting is we now have really good data on this. Uh, thanks to Rebecca Diamond and her team at Stanford, uh, they did a groundbreaking paper. And if you want to learn more about rent control, you want to check out this paper. Um, and what they basically, they were able to study rent control and they were able to see uh, through uh, an, an unexpected natural experiment, uh, the, the impact of it. And one of the things that happened was it actually led to a 15% decline in rental housing units, right? It's the only policy I'm aware of that is supposed to try to make housing more affordable, but ends up heartbreakingly uh, reducing the supply of rental housing. Uh, what happens? Uh, the uh, owners of condos and, and single family homes that they had pre that, that, uh, that, that had rented them out say, I don't want to be in the rental business anymore. I'm going to sell to an owner occupant. The home is still there, but it's not up for rent. And that's a real problem if you're a renter. So the problem, the issue is, is that rent control, uh, uh, it does help uh, some current residents. Um, there's a whole discussion, again, we can have on why, why I say uh, some current residents, but it, help, it does help the ones that are, that are in. Challenges, of course, is it doesn't help people who are non-rent controlled units. They now have a bunch of people bidding for now uh, that, that small universe of unrent controlled units. And we actually have fewer units to go around. And that is why we see um, this, this perverse um, uh, impact of rent control. Um, again, we can, we can chat more about this as we have time. Uh, what I will note is that this is, this is a story from a couple of days ago. Um, Californians have twice in the last two years, when given the opportunity to expand rent control, have said no. It was by 60% in this last vote. Um, and, and again, if, if rent control worked, I would be happy. But unfortunately, we just don't see it. Uh, we see those, those negative consequences. And what it also reveals to us is that this is a very complicated topic. The reason rent control ultimately doesn't work is that it's a policy that treats a symptom, but not the underlying condition. So let's talk about the underlying condition. The underlying condition is this, we have not built the, uh, the, the amount of housing that is needed in order to, to, to make housing available for, uh, for all. Um, so what we're looking at is a graph here. I just want to highlight some things. This is 1974. Um, the lower line, um, that is household growth. That's the number of new households formed each and every year. And this upper line is the number of new homes that have been built uh, since 1974, right? Each and every year. And what's interesting, of course, you all will immediately notice that the number of homes built each year has always, almost always, exceeded the number of new households. And that should make sense. Uh, it's, and, and see, people think, well, does that, mean, that must mean we have just a, an enormous oversupply of inventory. If every single year we're building more houses than there are new households, surely that means there's a huge increase in inventory. And unfortunately, um, that, uh, that, that thought, which is very reasonable, neglects a key idea of scrappage, right? That is to say, homes deteriorate, homes get torn down. Some of these homes are replacing old homes. And so it is very important that each and every year, not only do we build enough homes, uh, new homes for, uh, for the new households, but we build more than enough new homes. And that has been the case for most of the last 50 years, but not for the last eight. And that's a huge deal. Uh, what we saw was, of course, we, we know the global financial crisis in 2008. Um, there's a lot of reasons for the lack of construction, but the, 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 the main ones, the main culprits are uh, er, uh, excess supply from 2000. Again, there is, uh, there, there is this this gap is pretty substantial, as we can see. I mean, it was a sustained period of, of substantial overbuilding. 
And uh, it's also worth noting we have a labor shortage. Um, this now gets to the whole question of immigration policies, which I mean that's a, that's a that's a whole other lecture uh, and a different class entirely. But it's something to think about, uh, which is do we have the labor we need to build these homes? And from 2010 to 2018, we really haven't. And then, of course, there's the issue of increased regulation, um, and this is we're going to talk about regulation. Uh, you will not hear me argue that that all regulation is bad. Uh, there's very, very good reason to have regulation, but sometimes that can be very, very challenging, and we need to think carefully about the trade offs related to that. Uh, the uh, Freddie Mac, which is a group that uh, it's a it's a um, it's a it's a quasi governmental agency that uh, is involved in the home loan business. Um, they they looked at this data as well. Um, so we're we're all we're looking at different sources and seeing the same picture. Again, what I'll just note here, uh, Freddie Mac uh, did, did a good job of, of noting uh, their data actually goes back to 1968. Right, we're talking about you know Lyndon Johnson being president um, at that time. We going all the way back. There's only been one year when we've had um, house growth less than, this is, this is new home construction of less than 1.2 million. And let me tell you something, the population back in the 60s and 70s and 80s was significantly less. So this is actually understating just how, uh, just how, how, how badly we've done at building new housing supply. And we've been under that watermark, that $1.2 million, or 1.2 million uh, housing unit uh, watermark. We've we've been below that uh, since since 2008. So that's a big deal for us. Uh, Freddie Mac, uh, they did some numbers, which I really like. Um, they, they, they estimate that we're about 2.5 million home housing units short. That is to say, um, just all housing units of all type and all affordability levels. Um, we need an additional 2.5 million today, just to get caught up. Right. And that and, and we're, we haven't built. I mean, to, again, I just want to I want to this is so important that we realize this. This is two point five million. Right. This mark right here. So if we deliver that today, we would get caught up. We're not even close to delivering that in any given year. In fact, we're falling behind each and every year that goes by. We're falling further and further behind and we're leading to that uh, to this this um, um, this outcome. Uh, they suggest that in our in our tight housing market, about three point three uh, million. The, uh, by the way, I see some great questions coming in. Um, what I'm going to do is, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and, and we're going to we'll go through the material because we have a lot of ground to cover. I want to talk about Jane Jacobs and her incredible uh, contributions to how we think about affordable housing. Um, but uh, so we'll, we'll we'll chat at the end. I don't want you to think I'm ignoring you. I'm excited that you're excited, um, but I want to make sure that we we get all this out because there's a lot of a lot of things to think about here. So please do keep up with your questions, uh, and I'll I'll answer as many of them as I can. So what needs to happen? Um, you guys know where I'm going with this. We need to build. We need to build a lot more. And that is why, again, I go back to this whole thing. There's a lot of distractions and housing discussions. Uh, California, they spent millions of dollars arguing over rent control, when really, my opinion is they ought to have been thinking about how do we build more? How do we expand the pie, not argue about how much the cost of each piece is? Um, and, and, and expanding the pie works. And that's a really, really big idea. Um, here is, uh, as, as Jill mentioned, I'm, I'm on the, the board of directors of the Apartment Association of Metro Denver. Um, so I do a lot of their economic work. And, uh, and so I, I, there's, a, there's some really, really good data. They've got data going back to 1981 on, on rent prices in Denver. Um, and what do we see? Well, so first and foremost is we see, uh, this is occupancy is what you're looking at here. And this is, rep this, I just happen to have really good data on Denver. But this is representative of, of any uh, US city. What we're looking at is the relationship between occupancy, which is how many units are occupied, and rent growth. And that's what, so on this, on this right hand side, we're going to see rent growth. And just to make your life a little bit easier, uh, just so you know, the, this, this blue line right here, I'm actually colorblind, so I'm not sure if that's blue, but that line uh, is, uh, is, uh, is the roughly 0%. And here's what we see. Um, something which really makes sense to us, which is when occupancy is high, meaning there are very few units available, rents get pushed up. When occupancy is low, right, rents get pushed down. And so that is, we, we have a formula for doing this. We can figure out how to create, um, how, to, how, to, how to ease the, the rental, uh, the, 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 the rent burden, um, and creating additional space does that. Now, I should say creating additional occupancy. So how do we reduce occupancy? 
Well, again, I mean, I suppose we could tell everyone to leave. Uh, that's, I don't know exactly how you do that. What you do instead is you build. Um, this is a zoom in. This is, uh, this is uh, 2011 through 2019. And this is rent growth. And we see this giant mountain uh, of rent growth. Uh, we see it increase uh, in, in reaching excruciating high levels in 2014 and 15, and then drop off. What happened? Did everyone just get sick of Denver and leave? Not at all. In fact, they kept coming. What changed was we started building a tremendous amount of units that are coming in for Denver. There was a lot of construction going on. And so this is what I want to suggest to you that we need to be thinking about. We need to be thinking about how do we build more? How do we build the right kind of units? How do we build them in the right places? And how do we think about assembling and, and fixing, not just for a short-term um, uh, uh, policy, but a long-term perspective? So how do we do that? Well, first, we need to think about how, um, how, what it takes for housing to actually get built. Um, so to think about that, we have to kind of work backwards on this. We have to think that if you own a property and you are renting it out, anyone who's owning a property, there are, there are annual operating expenses that you have to pay. But by far and away, the biggest cost that you incur in any given year are going to be your financing costs, that mortgage you took out. And why do you have a mortgage, right? Why do we have these huge loans that sit on these properties uh, that we pay interest to the banks for? Well, those are the loans to repay the capital that was used to build the property to begin with. And so what we're looking at here is this is the, these are the development costs. So uh, for a typical deal, and it'll vary from place to place, but land costs typically 15 to 20% of the overall building. Um, soft cost, and that's the design and the architecture and the planning and, and the legal stuff. Um, that's about another 15 to 20%. And then hard cost, the, the bricks and the mortar and the, and the windows and the paint. Um, that's about 60 to 70% of your building cost. And so all of these costs have to be paid for upfront before the housing unit gets built or before it gets occupied, I should say. And, and so the way we do that is we, we, don't, we don't save up all of our money and, and, uh, and you know, live outside for 30 years and then, and then build our homes. We take out a mortgage that covers those costs. But it's very important to realize that that mortgage must be covered. There, you must have income. It, put another way, the amount of rent that you need to achieve in order to justify building this housing unit must be sufficient to cover the financing costs and the operating costs. And that is how uh, the building gets built. Uh, so let me give you an example. What happens here? What happens if the market rent is below the required rent to, to justify the building? Will this unit get built? And of course the answer is no, right? New development does not occur if market rents are below what's called construction feasibility, feasible levels. And so what happens is that construction gets delayed. And the, we saw that bidding that happens, everyone starts bidding up and the rent moves up a little bit, um, still not enough to cover it. So we go back to our musical chairs, everyone starts bidding up more and more. We're getting desperate now for housing because it's getting cold outside. And that eventually pushes, that force pushes the, mar the new market rent up to the point at which now uh, it's, it's feasible. And, and so, so great news, we've got a unit built, right? But the bad news is we're now at a much higher rent level than we were before. And we still have all of those people, again, that 5 million 18 year olds each and every year that are entering into the housing market. So that is a big deal for us. And let's talk about how we're going to address that. How can we create more housing without waiting for rents to rise? Well, there's a bunch of policies I'm gonna walk through. Uh, I do wanna, the, the most important thing for you to know is the framework, right? Cause you're gonna hear, whenever you hear a housing policy or if you're discussing housing policy, and I hope that you do discuss housing policy, it sounds very nerdy, but, but we need you to be talking about this. I want you to be thinking in this framework. And that way, even if there's some new, uh, an, an innovative idea that I haven't even heard of, that, that no one's heard of yet, you can put in this framework and say, how will it work? So first and foremost is we reduce financing costs indirectly by reducing development costs, right? We reduce the land cost, for example. Uh, if we can somehow make the land cost cheaper, uh, reduce the land cost, that will reduce the financing costs that will reduce the required rent. 
we can, the soft costs I mentioned, again, a huge part of construction, if we can reduce the soft costs, we can reduce the financing costs and we can reduce the required rent. You guys know where I'm going with this next one, hard costs. If we can make it cheaper to build um, through, through, uh, through better engineering or, or, or new technology that will help us build faster and cheaper, right? And, and safer, hopefully still, uh, we can reduce those costs, reduce the financing costs and re reduce the required rent. So these are all ways that we can indirectly uh, address this. It's important to note, by the way, that, that the regulatory burden um, that I mentioned is a really big deal. Um, this is something we really need to be thinking about. Um, and what I would suggest is, again, I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna clarify a couple of things. First and foremost is regulatory burden isn't just something that people complain about. It, it's a big deal. Uh, the National uh, Multifamily Housing Council did a, did a study in 2018, and they estimate that about 32% of a new rental unit's cost comes from, or it can be tied directly to regulations, right? These regulations, and I've listed a bunch here, I won't bore you with the details, and these slides will be available afterwards, so you can, you can pour over these. But the bottom line is what they found, and or you can also go and check out their paper, which is an interesting one. But what they found was that reduces that that it, it, it's it's about a third of their overall costs are incurred directly related to regulation. Um, so, am I suggesting that we just scrap all regulations? No. Uh, there are some very very good regulations that are out there that make homes safer, that make them more energy efficient, uh, that make them more valuable, and I'm I'm for that. But we do have to be sensitive to it. We have to think about that. When someone says, oh, we should do this thing. Um, so I, I'll, I'll give an example that was in, in Denver. It's popular around the world. Um, let's put uh, gardens on top of roofs, right? The Green Roof Initiative. Um, there's a lot of, of, of um, merit to that idea. But we do have to think about the cost. We have to think about uh, we have to say, okay, we do want, we don't, we, we don't like the heat island effect and we want, we want green roofs and there's reasons that we think that's a valuable thing. Fair enough. But let's look at the cost. Let's make sure before we pass that law that we say, yes, uh, we understand the cost and we're willing to, uh, as a society, uh, take that burden. Uh, and if we're not willing to, we're going to be very, very careful that we don't do those things. By the way, if you're wondering uh, if this is just an industry uh, industry report and you're going to say, well, who, who trusts the industry report? Um, I would just note that uh, uh, Giorco, uh, Gior, Giorco, um, has uh, also looked at this, um, and so this is a, this is an academic looking at this now, noting uh, and what what they did was they looked at at industry burden and they looked at home prices, and sure enough, there is a very very uh, clear uh, connection, a direct connection between areas where there were high regulatory burdens, and they have like create of course little academic nerds. This is what we do. We create an index. Uh, for this to, to measure regu uh, the re uh, regulations. And of course, what we found is more regulations, higher home prices. So they're, they're, it's a big deal. It's not just people complaining that, oh, we don't like regulation. It's that it adds to cost and we need to make sure that we, that we, that we think that through. In terms of financing, uh, there, uh, that's option number two. We talked about just reducing construction development costs. Uh, you can also reduce financing costs directly. That's an option for us. Um, that we're gonna talk about some ways to do that. Um, that will allow us to reduce rent. Uh, you could, of course, uh, reduce operating costs. There aren't a lot of opportunities for that, but there are some and they're worth pursuing. Again, that would reduce the required rent. And again, remember what we say, required rent. Uh, this, is not, this is not an academic thing. This isn't a landlord saying, I require this kind of rent because I'm don't. You know, i not going to build. It is, the, it is the developer saying, I cannot build this unit. I can't raise the money to build this unit if I don't get this rent to pay for the costs associated with building the unit. So required rent is, is not a fuzzy idea. It's a very, very fixed and firm idea in terms of, of a constraint we need to think about as we pursue policy objectives. The final one is of course, uh, subsidizing rent, right? That's, a, it's, that, that's an easy one. It's, it's, it doesn't actually reduce the required rent, but it makes that rent affordable uh, to people who are paying it. So um, these are for, for time, um, we're about 35 minutes in. So I will, um, I, I'll, I'm gonna give a short shrift to these, except to say that I hope that you'll think about these um, because we have another big idea that I wanna cover um, and then take questions. But the idea here is that, that all of these fit somewhere in this matrix. And, and as you discuss them, as you think about them, as you weigh the merits, think about how they're going to work in this system so that we can make housing more affordable 
and still build additional units. And that's the, that is the key. That's the, that's the, the holy grail. So um, subsidizing rents by far and away the most successful is the Section 8 program. It's called the Housing Choice Voucher Program. Um, um, and, and that is without question, uh, academics love this program. Uh, it provides direct rental assistance to the people who need it. It's immediate. And it also doesn't have the, the knock-on effects that reduce housing supply long-term. So I, if, we, if, we could, if you could triple the, the Section 8 program, um, I, I would do it in a heartbeat if, if we could do that. Um, uh, again, costs money. I think it's worth it because I think housing is worth it. Uh, we can encourage more um, co-living arrangements, not so much in the, in the COVID world, but hopefully uh, if, we, if we get past this pandemic, that's an option. Uh, we can reduce land costs. There's all sorts of ways we can reduce that. Uh, so uh, cities own a lot of land. Uh, we can also, cities can also give special permission to build higher density, um, as for example, near transit stops. And there's some really good reasons to do that. Uh, but higher density is a good way to do it. More units on a, on, a, on a fixed piece of land will reduce the land cost per unit. We can reduce soft costs. Uh, again, there's all sorts of the, the, the this comes under the heading of, of a lot of regulation. Um, so permitting process, uh, the building fees, water tap fees, things like that. Uh, those are all things we can think about reducing. Again, it's trade-off to be sure, but we need to acknowledge that trade-off and think about where, which is more important to us as a, as a, as a city, um, as we set out and thinking about our, our budgeting priorities. Um, hard costs, uh, again, there's all sorts of things we can that, that government policies, and these are, these are government policies I'm referring to. Private industry should certainly still be working on this, but these are things that voters can say, I want affordable housing, I want more housing to be built, and therefore I'm, I, I direct you, my city, to do these things. Um, one of them is reducing parking requirements. There's a really good argument just on the environmental side for why that's important, but it also, of course, adds to housing affordability. Uh, and then, uh, of course, financing costs. This is where cities, uh, the government has a tremendous opportunity to help out. Uh, by far and away, the most uh, important is the, the LIHTC program, Low Income Housing Tax Credits. Uh, we can, that's, that's something we can talk about later on. That, that is, it is it, without question, it's, it's generated more affordable housing than any other program out there. And it is woefully underfunded. Um, and, it's, and it's like embarrassingly uh, for such a successful program, uh, but we don't fund it and we should. And I think, I hope through this conversation, you see that, that there is a place for government to help this, help out uh, in terms of creating more housing supply and making it affordable. Um, buy tech, the way to go. But there are also things like uh, tax exempt bond financing. Um, there's ways that there are, are ways, these, these are all fall into the category of reducing financing costs, making the money cheaper. We're, we're still gonna borrow the same amount of money. We still, we haven't reduced these costs, but what we've done is we've made it cheaper to pay for that money, all right? And so that's, that's an option for us. We need to be thinking about that. Um, you'll note, by the way, this phrase, there's a guy named Mike Zollner uh, out in Colorado who, who, uh, who taught me this. Um, and his point was, there is no single, uh, uh, single uh, silver bullet we need to be looking at, you know, you know, 10, 20, uh, you know, 10, 10% solutions or, or 25% solutions. There are a lot of options out there for us to look at uh, and more progressively assume, uh, pursue. Reducing operating costs, as I said, there's not a lot of opportunities there, but certainly reducing taxes. Um, that's challenging for cities because cities need to fund this somehow. But again, I submit, we need to think about our funding priorities. Uh, you know, my thing is, I don't mean to be blunt, but you know, that's where it's, we are where we are. It's either a priority or it's not, right? And that's what I say to my, my, my you know, public officials, either this is a priority uh, and we're gonna spend money on it. And if it takes raising taxes, that's what we do because we believe it's that important, right? So that's a tough conversation to have. So uh, spoiler alert though, uh, for those of you who are in the, the, the building trade environment are saying, go Teo, that's all we just want. We want more construction, it's gonna solve the problem. Uh, of course, uh, it, it is more complicated than that. We need to be thinking about building the right type of units, right? That's very important. We can't just, it, just, it doesn't count if we build the wrong type of units, just you know, make mansions that are, that are off in, the, in, the, in rural areas, right? We need a wide range of housing types, a, a, a housing portfolio that we can pass on to future generations. And I don't mean personally pass on, but we, the, you know, the, the 2020s uh, generations pass on to who will come after us. 
Uh, that includes a wide variety, again, not just apartments, uh, duplexes, single family homes, attached dwelling units. Um, those are all things. This is really taking off the ADU uh, attached dwelling unit fad. And I think that's going to be great for increasing density uh, because that's, that's what we need. Um, speaking of, of building, it's not just that we build the right type. We also need to build in the right places. Right. This is a big thing. Uh, we need to be building next to transit corridors. Um, right. I mean, we, we talked about this earlier with, with Ed Glazer's comment. The reason people locate places is to be close to something, right? To spatial proximity. And if we can't get you right next to the thing you need, the next best thing is to get you close to a thing that will get you to the thing, right? So get you close to a transit line. And now we get into infrastructure and that's a big deal for us but we need to think about transit corridors and, and job centers. Uh, we need to be building there. And again, that's where density plays a huge role in making this work. And, and where, where we can't do density, uh, we certainly wanna think about transit corridors, get people, uh, break people from the chains of, of spatial disparity. Uh, and that is a huge problem. Again, we go back to the, 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 the atrocious track record of, of addressing systemic racism, uh, housing played a huge role in it, a huge inexcusable role in that. And, and, and while technically the laws have changed, the echoes of that are still alive and, and, and we need to be, we need, we, it, it's gonna take a dedicated effort um, to, to undo um, decades of damage that's been done by, that, by, by uh, uh, policies that, that, that undermine our effort for, for social justice and equality. So we need to be thinking about that. Um, we need to be building for all income levels. Okay, here's the one that everyone's going to remember, and I'm going to get emails uh, pouring in. Um, so I'm going to say the thing. Uh, here it is. Yes, luxury units, right? I'm going to I'm going to stand up in front of this group and say we need to be building luxury units. Um, that is uh, that is that is very controversial, um, and and I'm going to say we need to build as many as we can. Uh, many people will say uh, that you know that we need you know yeah we're building a lot, but we're only building luxury, and that's and that's not good enough. Um, I'm going to bring in one of my absolute idols in the housing uh, world in a couple minutes to talk about why that idea is not as crazy as it sounds. Luxury units are, are uh, they're, they're certainly, um, they're buildable and that's the key thing. We can build those. Let's talk about why that's important though in a minute. The other thing is, again, building is expensive and it takes a very long time. Uh, great, Teo, cool. We'll just, we'll build our way out of this, right? But remember, we're, we're only building you know, one and a half million units a year, we need to be building, you know, two and a half just to catch up. Um, how long is this going to take? Uh, here's an example. Uh, the, these are the additional units that are created. Um, this is like a quarter million units. Uh, this, I don't know, it's like 100,000 units. Um, from a government standpoint, uh, the spending we're doing is a drop in the bucket. It's nowhere close to what we need. And people need help right now. And that's where, again, direct rental assistance is, is, is crucial. It should be a huge part of our affordable housing policy is getting that assistance to people who need it. Um, I think COVID certainly uh, helped orient people as to why that may, why direct rental assistance or direct assistance in general is a good, can be a very good plan. Um, this is a, this is a, 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 a pandemic of, of housing affordability. And I think if we use that same concept, I think it would help people understand how direct uh, rental assistance works. Okay, last thing, long term, and this is, I, I promised I'd get back to this, um, the secret of affordable housing, the long term secret, and I, I say this for last because I want this to be the thing that you, that you eventually leave with, um, and we'll summarize the chat in a moment, but um, affordable housing isn't actually built, it is accumulated. And for those of you who don't know who this is, this is Jane Jacobs, and she is, she's, she's my idol in terms of housing. If I could go back in time um, and, and hang out with someone, uh, it would be Jane Jacobs. Um, she had a brilliant mind. She wrote her, her, her famous book, Death and Life of Great American Cities in 1961. Um, and one of the things to know about Jane Jacobs, among all the other things, was she had no formal training in city planning. Right? She just had a brilliant mind, an inquisitive mind. And that's why I'm glad like, for, that we have a thousand people in this session right now. And, and all of you have enough of your inquisitive minds to come to this. I hope that you will do what Jane Jacobs did and use that inqui that the, your inquisitive minds to seek out solutions, perceive the problem, understand its dimensions, and begin to form solutions. 
So what, what, why would Jane Jacobs of all people um, talk, talk about this idea and say, it's okay. Uh, again, she's a huge out, uh, progressive housing advocate. And I, I, I do believe she would be okay with, with what I just said about a uh, luxury housing. She looked at the, at the long term, and I think her perspective is exactly right. She said, we are dealing with the economic effects of time, not hour by hour through the day, but with economics of time by decades and generations. She pointed something about, about all those luxury units that we're just talking about, the luxury towers you've seen being built in the last couple of years. She noted something about time. She said, time makes the high building costs of one generation the bargains of the following generation. She noted that time pays off those original capital costs, and that depreciation is reflected in lower yields, meaning lower prices uh, for a building. So uh, that is the key thing. Um, this idea of, it's called filtering. She was the one that really kind of pioneered this idea. Um, and, and for the longest time, um, there has been debate over filtering. Filtering doesn't, people were wondering, does it really work? Uh, and fortunately, we now know um, from, um, uh, from a, a, from a, uh, from a Change thing, right? Here we go. Um, uh, from a report that came out in, in a, a paper that was done in 2014. 2014 was a great year. 2014 to 18 was a great time um, in it for, for housing nerds because we had some we had some theories that everyone kind of thought and felt, but really hadn't been able to prove. And we got the data. We had some really smart people, some inquisitive minds, um, find ways to measure the effects that we just kind of thought made sense but weren't sure. And and filtering works. Um, so this is a paper. This is a um, our private markets and filtering a viable source of low income housing. Um, so this is Rosenthal did this in 2014, and it was like like just it was nerd fest 2014 when when this paper was released because it it, it proved something very important. It actually quantified filtering. So um, for those of you, again, uh, and many will not be convinced by this argument, and that's okay. Dialogue is what we need. Um, if, if, if it's distasteful to, to see luxury condos being built when, uh, when there are people that, that, are, that when clearly we need more affordable housing, I want you to think about the new car market. I want you to ask yourselves, when did you buy your first new car? For most people, including me, I've never bought a new car. Right? I've always had someone else buy the new car and I buy it from them uh, five years later, 10 years later, right? My first, my first truck was a 1982 Nissan Datsun pickup truck, uh, right? It was headed for the scrapyard um, and, and, and that was perfect because it was affordable to me. I would, I, would, I would never have been able to buy a brand new pickup truck, right? But I could buy a very old pickup truck. And that is something to be thinking about. So it is natural to us to think about buying the used car market and to say that makes sense. Let the people who uh, circumstances allow them to buy the brand new cars, let them you know, drive it when it's brand new and that's great for you. But when you're done using it, once it's gotten a little bit of depreciation, a little bit of wear and tear and you've moved on to the next thing, it is now available to be used in the, in for subsequent markets and resold and resold. And uh, Rosenthal proved that. Uh, Rosenthal, it's, it's, the, it's now, it's conclusive, filtering happens, it works. Uh, what, what, and it's huge, the effect is huge. What he basically noted, and without boring you with the details, is to note that about the, it, it, what he was able to do was to measure the incomes of new arrivals. So whenever a, whenever a unit turned from one person to the next, um, he, would me he was able to measure that income. And sure enough, what he basically found was each new inhabitant of a unit, each new occupant, was at a, a typically was at about a uh, about eleven percent for rental units, about twelve percent less affluent than the one than the than the person that they were that they were moving in that they were replacing, and that is filtering, right? It was brand new and shiny at first, but eventually that 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 price it commanded. Uh, the cumulative effect is huge. It's seven for rental units after fifty years. The people who the, the way to interpret this is that the people who moved in fifty years uh, later or someone who's moving into a 50 year old building is paying about a third of what someone is paying for a brand new version of that building, right? So filtering actually works. That is the key thing here. Uh, and, and, and Rosenthal be, uh, beseeches us to keep that in mind. He says that, that, that uh, housing assistance advocates, the message is to take seriously the ability to generate, uh, the market's ability to generate low income housing especially among rental units. Um, there are caveats, so we can talk about that if there's time, but let me leave you with some thoughts. 
um, first and foremost is, uh, well, firstly, thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to think about our cities, because the cities, we tend to think in abstract, but cities are, are people, right? That is what cities are. It's, it, it is, it rep it's, the, it's a physical manis manifestation of our dreams for our society. And so it's important that we think carefully about those dreams because we care for the people who are, who are a part of that. Uh, in terms of, of how we got to where we did, if someone stops you on the street and says, tell me in 30 seconds what happened, uh, why do we have a, an affordable housing crisis? Here it is. Uh, after the global financial crisis, uh, home construction failed to keep up with demand, uh, just stunningly. Uh, we know that housing shortages drive price increases. Uh, it's a game of musical chairs where unfortunately those who are least able to are forced to bid against each other for that space. Um, and, and that, that you know, for current policy advocates, we need to think about treating the cause, not the symptoms. Uh, my biggest beef with rent control is that it ties up a lot of resources. It gets us on the wrong argument um, and it and makes enemies where there should be partners in working together. Uh, the issue is we need to build more units. There is no silver bullet. Uh, we're gonna need a, to look at a lot of different ways to build more and we need to be smart about it. It's not just about volume is not enough. We need to build the right type in the right place. And then finally, we need to think about Jane Jacobs. We need to remember that a long, long term, affordable housing isn't built, it is accumulated. Uh, the, 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 the new houses of today will be the affordable units in the future. In terms of what's next, uh, the, the, you, uh, you're, you're already here, you're already doing it, but I just wanna, I wanna congratulate you and encourage you to stay involved. Um, this is a very, very hot topic in terms of, and, and it can be very contentious. Um, we need to have these conversations. Uh, we, need to, we need to have a disagreements and work through those disagreements because we, this is too important to get wrong. Uh, for those of you who are in academia, uh, further research, uh, my thing is, uh, you've, you've heard me say it, and I, I firmly believe this, I think the government needs to be spending more on this. Um, and the question, though, a reasonable question someone may ask is, how much more? How much should we spend on this? And that is an open question. Um, one way you should do it is we should, be put, we should be doing more research to put a price on the cost, the social costs of not addressing the problem. Right? And I think I submit those costs are enormous uh, and, and, and to some extent incalculable in terms of what it does to the fabric of our society when so many people can barely afford to live in our society. Right? I, think, I, think the, I think the costs are, 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 as I said, astronomical, if not incalculable. But if we can calculate it, then you can bring that and say, this is why we need to triple the, we need triple section eight support. We need to, we need to quadruple low-income housing tax credits. Well, why? because it's worth it. And even if you don't care about, you know, the, you know, your fellow person, and I hope you, hopefully you do, you should care that it's better for society and it's worth it for us to do it. We also need to talk about, and there's a whole thing we didn't really get to talk too much here about, about spatial disparity, which is how do we fix that? What are the costs of creating isolated neighborhoods uh, where, where poverty becomes concentrated uh, and, and for those who are in it uh, becomes uh, very hard to escape. We need to put a, would put a price on that uh, because then we can put our money where our mouth is and, and get moving on this topic. Uh, Jill had mentioned um, that we do have classes. We talk about this. This is the, this is the Harvard Extension School is a broad community and we welcome you to it. Um, so if you're interested, of course, we do have real estate classes. These happen to be the ones that I teach, um, but there are many out there. And by far and away, the most important thing we can do is stay engaged, stay involved, don't lose heart. And hopefully with our combined effort, we can be the generation that, that solves this. And I think we can, it's just a matter of the willpower. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. I'll be glad to take your questions, Jill, you lead the way. Yeah, uh, Teo, thank you. My gosh, uh, such a wonderful presentation. I've noticed a few questions that have come in relative to the pandemic, particularly with remote work shifting, uh, you know, the relevancy of location. Elsewhere, do you have any predictions of whether or not that exacerbates this crisis or potentially aids to the solution? Um, yeah, so first and foremost is we're, we're just hot off of the, the news about a, vac a potential vac two potential vaccines, which seem to be very promising. Um, now that we know the end is in sight, if we can hang on long enough, 
we will be able to six months from now, a year from now, be able to have some clarity on this. Um, one thing I think that is absolutely uh, clear uh, that I don't think you need to wait six months to, to note um, is this idea of spatial disparity. Um, so this pandemic has been, uh, it's been hard on everyone, but it has been incredibly hard on, on workers who are in jobs that, that you can't do remotely. Uh, many of them have either lost their jobs or, which is, I don't know if this is worse or, or better, um, still have to do them and subject themselves to dangerous conditions every single day uh, and choose between you know, that and, and, and not having housing. Um, and so I, I think we need to be thinking about that. Uh, spatial inequality, I think is a huge thing. Um, and that goes into the question of where are people living uh, and, and how do we ensure that people can be connected with jobs that will lift them up the economic ladder. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, on a very positive note, do you know of a city someplace in the world that has used an innovative approach to tackle this issue? You know, it's interesting, every city is gonna be different. And unfortunately, one of the great challenges of, of, of uh, looking at this is it's very hard uh, for, for economists to tease out exactly what was this the thing that went well um, or was it not? Um, I am particularly excited about Minneapolis. Uh, Minneapolis has, uh, they, they have, they're very progressive in terms of they, they abolished single family zoning, which I think is great. Um, they didn't go quite so far as um, say Oregon, um, who is probably know has embraced rent control. And again, I, I, it's not, I want housing affordability. I just worry that that's becoming a distraction. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna watch Minneapolis very, very closely because I think they have a lot of progressive people who are thinking long-term and, uh, and are coming up with innovative ideas. Oh, that's great. Uh, now, Peter asks, um, how do rising land prices and inflation affect filtering and building values? Um, uh, Peter, that's a great question. It's, uh, it's, it gets a little nerdy, uh, not surprisingly, but I'm a nerd, so I'm, I'm on board with this. Um, it, it reduces the filtering for sure. Um, the, the, to the, this is actually the, um, uh, there was a little caveat that, um, uh, that, that I noted here. Uh, the caveat is that where, where you have areas of higher uh, house price appreciation, the filtering uh, effect is lower. It's still there, it's still present, it's just a little bit lower. And so the kind of his, what I would suspect his uh, prescription would be uh, have more price supports in terms of, of direct financial assistance in these areas uh, because that, 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 that downward sloping um, uh, price that we see of, of aging units is not quite so steep. And so that's, uh, but, but that does play a role. Uh, great. Uh, now, regarding inclusionary housing, is it a viable solution for gentrification or is, are the market forces just too overwhelming to make sure that people who created the community can still be part of it? Um, displacement is one of the biggest challenges and it falls under this category of things that, and I, I, hope, that you, I hope that you follow up on research on this, uh, is the social cost. Um, so uh, inclusionary zoning, for those who don't know, what that basically means is, hey, um, if you build a new 100 unit apartment building, you need to set aside a certain percentage of those units, maybe 20% and for uh, families that are of lower income, make it affordable for, for, um, for uh, families that are struggling. Um, so um, it's challenging. Um, the reason it's challenging is because of this little, this graph thing, uh, which is that if you reduce uh, the rent on 20% of the units, that means the other 80% have to carry that. And what happens is, is that they don't, you can't just, I can't just say, hey, you have the misfortune of living in my building and being non-subsidized. So you have to pay more than the market, right? What happens is the market has to meet that level first before the unit gets built. So inclusionary zoning initially is very, very hard because, uh, because it, it, it takes, you have, to, you have to build, you have to wait till rents are higher uh, to build it. That being said, if we had started inclusionary zoning 50 years ago, Right, we would be in a much different spot. So thinking in today's market, I, I can see why people resist it. Uh, but thinking long term, I think that's the way to go uh, because spa uh, um, uh, space is irreplaceable. Um, mm -hmm. And building near transit stops, for example, is you can't do that 50 years later. So, um, so there's that. Um, I'll just make the comment. You talked about displacement of gentrification. I think that is an enormous area that we need to talk about. Um, the human capital that gets, that gets uh, destroyed 
when someone is forced from their neighborhood and they're 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 they they're displaced from their neighbors. The people who who they, they would help each other, watch each other's kids. They could get 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 a ride to work. Um, when that fabric is shredded, that the norm the damage to the people who who have been affected is huge, and we need to reconcile that and factor that into our thinking. As we as we look to give new life to neighborhoods, so I'm for re rejuven a rejuvenation of neighborhoods, but we do need to think about all the costs that are associated with that. Great. Uh, back to filtering. Uh, William asks, how could zoning and city planning help or hinder filtering effects from aging luxury housing? Um, so that's a great question. These are you, you guys are you guys are <laughs> spot on. I love this group. Um, okay, so it has to do with building the right type. Um, so what I would just say is we need to be thinking about not just what is the appropriate use at this time, but 50 years, 100 years from now when we're all gone, but the next generation is going to be impacted by our decision today, what do we want built here? Um, and so that's where uh, Minneapolis has basically said we don't want any more single family home lots because it's just uh, that's just such a huge waste of space. Um, and, and it creates this low density, which means you have to have a car, which means you're, you're further separated from services. And so what I would say is, is that we should think, I'd like to think of a framework wherein the costs today of, or the, the cost benefit analysis that we do today reflects the externality, as we'd say in economics, of the future uh, fabric of our of our um, of our cities, um, and it's interesting because you could you can weigh in on both sides of that cost versus benefit, um, and who if there is a benefit, who pays it? Does the city give a subsidy for the developer building a, a unit which would be more appropriate fifty years from now? I don't know, but it certainly is worth talking about. Great, Teo, related to gentrification, uh, is there a city where that this is not taking place or has just not reached that point yet? Uh, most cities are struggling with gentrification. Uh, remember gentrification is, um, you know, there, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenging situation because what's happening in gentrification is that a, a neighborhood has become, the values in the neighborhood have fallen so low, uh, that filtering has become so extreme that uh, it is now um, the, the the housing stock is is substandard and and is uh, is it, it, and is at a value point where it makes financial sense to basically tear down those buildings and then rebuild brand new and begin the neighborhood life cycle all over again. Um, and so that's what gentrification is. Gentrification specifically carries a negative connotation, uh, as well it should, because it 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 contemplates the question of what happens to those who are displaced. You know, it, the reason they're living there is because uh, they grew up there, but also probably because the housing stock is being, having been depreciated is probably pretty affordable. Where are they going to go and how is that going to affect them? That's uh, absolutely should be part of any conversation with regard to redevelopment of a neighborhood. Great. Uh, getting back to the topic of the pandemic, uh, Brooks asks, to what extent utility assistance mitigation uh, might um, help versus direct rent assistance? Brooks, good to see you. Uh, they, uh, it's, it's good to see some of my past students. So um, the uh, utility assistance, uh, that's a great, uh, that's, a, that's a direct subsidy, uh, which I think is, it makes sense. I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of direct cash transfers because you, you, can, you, can, um, you can control them pretty closely. You can monitor the use um, and, and there's, there's, uh, there's ways to really mitigate the loss that you might incur. And so, um, so what I would say is, um, uh, I think that's, I support them. Um, I think that's, I think it's all part of housing costs and whether you call it rent or, or utility reimbursement or um, utility subsidy, um, it's all about helping make housing more affordable. Great, um, Hope asks, if someone has an interest in tech and engineering, but has never been exposed to the housing world, is there a field that they could look into working on or books to read or other you know, potential sources that you'd recommend? Yes, and and hope we we desperately need you in our field uh, because one of the you you oh, thank you and thank you for being here and thank you for being a part of this uh, because remember how much land costs or how much uh, hard costs meaning construction costs are 
in, in, in building our buildings and also operating costs, how much does it cost to operate those buildings, operate all the, the, the heating and ventilation and, and air conditioning units. And um, so we need people who can think about the physical world that we're building and help us build it better. And so the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, I would, I would recommend Jim, Jane Jacobs like that's if I'm on a desert island, I'm, I'm taking her book with me because it gets you thinking about how, um, how cities truly are the, the physical manifestation of our, of our, you know, of our aspirations. And so, um, so I would, I would say that that's, there's, there is a place for you and, and we need you to be part of the solution. So, so come on over. Uh, we, we welcome you with open arms. Oh, I love that. Well, you know, Taya, we're getting uh, short on time and I think you've answered most of the substantive questions here. We've had so many great questions. Uh, Taya, do you have any last words that you would like to share with our attendees? No, I just I, I just want to say I, I I hope our paths cross again. Um, this is the this was a this was a, in the as you can tell by uh, by the by the the speed of the presentation. Um, there is a lot to talk about here, but but we could not be I think at a more important moment in history, and I think that it's going to take all of us to be a part of it. So um, go out have these conversations. Let people know what you've learned about. Um, challenge their assumptions. Let them challenge you. The more we talk about this, the more attention it receives, the better the likelihood that we're going to be able to finally get this solved. It is a, it is a, a, a goal uh, and an objective that is worthy of us. Um, and we would certainly be unworthy, I think, of, 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 of future generations if we did not do everything we could to try to help tackle the affordability housing crisis that we face. So thank you for your time. I look forward to the next time our paths cross. Oh, wonderful, Teo. I thank you for such a thoughtful presentation. It's just so full of information. I just want to let people know that we will be sharing the recording of today's presentation, as well as Teo's slides uh, within the next week or so after the event. We will fully caption the video as well. Uh, so look out for that. But this is, again, one in a series of uh, events that we have coming up related to some of the most pressing issues of today. So please join us again in the future. And of course, look into uh, Teo's wonderful classes if you'd like to learn more about this very compelling topic. And as always, uh, should you need anything at all, our Office of Advancement is here to support you throughout your needs uh, for learning, for uh, lifetime development opportunities, as well as community building. So please reach out to us if there's anything that we can do for you in these times and join us again. And in the meantime, uh, be safe and be well. Thank you.